with that, it's my privilege to welcome our guest today. He's one of my best friends here on this campus, okay? And if, it, yeah, and if anyone can talk about how to start a year right and how to build healthy relationships in a semester, I think it is this guy. He's our new Assistant Director of Pastoral Care in Spiritual Development. He graduated with an MA, or yeah, an MA from Talbot in Pastoral Care and Counseling. Um, he oversees different groups on campus, uh, two are DEPS, which are people who are seeking freedom from pornography, and second is the dwelling for students who identify as LGBTQ or um, who experience same-sex attraction. Help me welcome Chris Baragan. All right, hey, so Chris, uh, you know, uh, you now lead our pastoral care charge in spiritual development, and you've been doing this for the past few years. Now, what are some of the things that you've noticed from Biola students? One of the things that, well, there's a lot of things that stand out, um, but when we sit with a student for pastoral care, um, we go back and we will take notes about what we talked about with the student, um, just to keep records so that we can um, just journey well with the student because we may see the student the next week or in a few months, but um, we take notes and the themes that have continually come up have been um, a rise in anxiety and depression, um, just in some really, um, also in some really unhealthy habits. Um, so a lot of pornography, a lot of um, unsafe sex practices and um, so we've seen all of this kind of rise to the surface as students are um, trying to process their lives. Um, and kind of underneath all of that mm. has been loneliness. Mm. And so, yeah, there's all of these different things that are happening. Um, but if I could try to capture um, a huge percentage of it, it would be that students feel really lonely. Yeah. So, you know, I definitely think you... I feel what loneliness is. How would you define loneliness for us? Um, so loneliness to me is an emotional state um, and, a, and a response, a reaction from our body. And so it'd be really easy to describe loneliness as like being separated from people. Um, and there's some components of that, of the withness that's important, but... Yeah. Um, I would say that loneliness is really like a response that our body has uh, to this feeling of being alone. And so it's actually something that we should pay attention to mm. in the same way that we would tend to a headache or, um, gosh, my knee really hurts. I wonder what's going on there. Yeah. Loneliness is something that, um, it's a way of our body responding yeah. um, to something that's going on. Yeah, so it seems like it's there and we kind of push through it and we, right. and we do different things. What are, what are common ways that you've seen students cope with loneliness? Yeah, um, so as I mentioned, I think uh, the things that come to mind immediately are substance abuse, um, engaging in unsafe sex practices, um, retreating, and so actually doing some of the opposite things, so hiding, yeah. um, kind of wallowing in a lot of shame and isolation, yeah. um, eating disorders, and so we've kind yeah. of seen it play out in a few different ways. Yeah. Um, but there's also, which are really easy to identify because they're, they're negative, right. but sometimes there's these like really good things, at least they look good on the outside, yeah. um, that are ways of uh, coping, um, and that could be I spend a lot of time doing schoolwork and I obsess in, um, in perfection and, or maybe I go to the gym three times a day. I don't go to the gym three <laughs> times a day. Um, I, I should maybe, um, but like uh, even that of like just over exercising and so where this is something good, it's good to care for ourselves in this way, but then yeah. it somewhere took a turn and so it becomes this obsession. So sometimes it can look really good on the outside. Yeah. Sometimes not so much. Yeah, so we've talked about how it looks like for students. What does loneliness look like for you, Chris? <sighs> I get to ask the hard questions. You so, do. Yeah. Um, so I'm an Enneagram 7, and if you know anything about the Enneagram, it's that, I, that usually means I'm like the life of the party. Um, and so a cornerstone almost of my character is one that is fun and spontaneous. Um, 
and I, and I know that for the majority of my life, I lived in that space of the extraness. Yeah. And so I would often think, well, if I feel lonely, then I just need to do more um, with people. I need to do things that are more exciting. Um, and really, I think I've felt lonely most of my life. Mm. Um, and it's only until recently, probably in the last three or four years that I have experienced a significant decrease in my loneliness. Yeah. And that's because I have moved away from this personality that I thought I needed to be. Mm. And I've actually become more of myself. Mm. And the myself sometimes is fun. Mm -hmm. And we know this. Yeah. And then sometimes. <laughs> Very fun. And sometimes it's just, I mean, I've literally done this to you. Mike, I'm, I'm having a, it's, I don't know what's going on. Can I just have a hug? Mm -hmm. which as a grown man, and I heard the laugh, feels a little weird. But there are just some times when I'm like, something's going on and I'm mm. having a hard time identifying it. Yeah. Can I bring you into what I'm experiencing and give you the opportunity to respond to that? Yeah. And so because I've taken the pressure off of myself to perform in a way of being what I think everyone wanted me to be, yeah. um, I've really just kind of been myself yeah and that's been uncomfortable yeah no I love that it seems like there's a personality part of you that you're performing for people mm -hmm. but it seems like now you've settled into who you are mm -hmm. by actually inviting other people into that space of honesty mm -hmm. like what are some key relationships then for you and how have you approached those key relationships yeah to, to, to combat the loneliness yeah so top of mind um, is probably my wife because that's one of the more intimate relationships I have. But I think we've even had at this point a few different um, parts of our marriage. Yeah. And this one that we're in right now in particular feels the most authentic. Mm. Like we are way past the pretty honeymoon <laughs> stage. <laughs> like we are knee deep in two young kids and a lot of life has happened in a lot of pain. Um, and like now we're in this place where we're just kind of in it together until we're able to show up. And yeah, we miss each other sometimes, a lot of times, and that's real. But I think that relationship is one that um, I've clearly seen a trajectory in the last 12 years, right? So 12 years of life together. I mean, we've both changed, we're different people. Yeah. Um, and then I would say even in um, relationship with close friends, um, you, my people, you know you're out there, um, where I have invited them into parts of myself that I would have otherwise shut them out to. Yeah. Um, so even last week, I had a day where I just thought I was a terrible dad. Um, and I called my friend and I was like, look, I just need to say that I feel like a really bad dad right now. Mm. Can you just, can you just listen? Mm -hmm. And so then he was able to share, like, actually, I totally felt that last week and I cried a lot. And I was like, you too? Like, you're the good dad. Um, so like, even in that of like, being less alone in the things that I feel, oh, surely this is only me. I'm the only person that feels like a bad dad today. Yeah. Um, and that's just not true. Yeah. Um, so I've seen it play out in relationships in a lot of different ways, even with my therapist. Like, we've entered into a lot more vulnerability and yeah. honesty, yeah. and so he has even said that um, I feel like a new client to him yeah. in some ways because we've gotten through so many walls that I had put up, mm. which is so weird because I'm like, I'm paying you to like get <laughs> through these walls, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Well, you said a key word there, you said vulnerability. Yeah. You said something about sharing yourself to people, and you know what, you've, you've developed a vocabulary and you're able to be more comfortable with yourself, you know, and I wonder, some of our students here, they, they might not have all of those things, those tools yet. How would, how can we develop some of these tools and how can we have the courage to, to try vulnerability with people? Yeah. So I think it's important one to identify the need. And so whether or not you know it, loneliness is actually really, really uh, dangerous to your body. Um, there's lots of studies that have shown that being lonely actually increases the likelihood of 
um, being sick, like catching a common cold by like three times. Um, when you're lonely, um, they show that there's micro awakenings in your sleep. And so you don't actually sleep through the night. You have these moments where you're kind of waking up that you're not even aware of. Um, and it's because it's almost your body's way of saying you're not safe, you're not with um, someone, you're not connected to. Um, and so I think identifying one, like this is a huge uh, topic that you need to, you just need to be self-aware of like the experience of loneliness and then how to, well, that's the hard part because yeah. you're right, language is important, but sometimes I don't feel like I've ever really had the right words. And so sometimes it's saying, hey, I don't really know what's going on right now, yeah. but I'm feeling disconnected or alone yeah. um, or like, I just feel like I'm in a funk, something's wrong. Um, and connection happens when there's two parties that are both willing to engage um, with one another and be vulnerable with one another. And so it's not simply me just getting it out and then you going, it's okay, buddy, like you're gonna be okay. Yeah. It's actually the response is important um, as well. And so it's this mutual sharing of vulnerability mm. um, where connection is made and connection is what directly combats the loneliness. Okay, well, I think there's a lot to say here, but I think one thing is clear, uh, everyone feels some sort of loneliness. Everyone. It's not just a one person thing, like I feel lonely, but other people don't, because Instagram is like this. Yep. So, you know, with that, I'm gonna say, we're gonna call time out, we're gonna invite our worship team to lead us in a song, and I'm gonna, we're gonna invite you guys to text in questions that we're gonna answer. Chris, you ready for this? Okay. I think so. Here we go. Here's our first question. Okay. What is the most helpful way to respond to a friend who has shared feelings of loneliness with you? Good question. Um, we have found that loneliness isn't the lack of people. Um, it's the lack of mutual vulnerability. Mm. And so the best way to respond is for you, um, the person who's receiving that, is to be vulnerable yourself um, to the other person. There's nothing to fix. The, this isn't a conversation about how do I fix your loneliness. Um, it's more of a creating connection, which yeah. I guess you could could be seen as a fix, but yeah. fix feels too like I just want to fix you. And right. really, the mutual vulnerability for the connection, it's good for both people. Yeah. So it's not just about like I need to fix you as my lonely friend. Yeah. I need the connection as well. Yeah, it's, it's about being seen and heard mm -hmm. and known at, that, at a deeper level. Right. Okay, great. So here's another question. In your work uh, with the sexuality groups, okay, uh, how do you see loneliness play out there? Yeah, um, people think that they're the only ones that are experiencing something. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I have heard someone say, uh, something to the effect of, I'm sure no one's ever told you this, but, and I'm like, I heard that like four times today. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's, the work in these groups is so important because what it does is it gives you guys a place to come together and to simply be with. Um, because again, and I feel like I've said this a couple times and so part of, I'm tired of hearing myself say it, um, but it's, really that God calls us to be with one another. God is with us. And so really these groups are important because it's the withness. It's yeah. even some of this, you know? Yeah, great, I love that. Here's another question. As we start off the school year, how can we build healthy relationships? Yes. Good question. It's good. Um, you might think that this is the answer um, that simply being in close proximity with people is the way to build healthy relationships. So you are coming off, you might be coming off of SOS week and all of these trainings and different things that you've done and like maybe you went to a camp or, um, and so you might feel like, yeah, like I feel really connected to people. Um, and there might be some connection there, but the proximity to people isn't an indicator of, um, connection. Mm -hmm. It's simply we're in the same space, which right. is some of it. Um, so how do you do it? Find something that it feels really hard for you to share. Something that you 
have maybe hidden a little bit inside of you and find a person that you feel connected to, mm -hmm. even if it's just like a little bit, because maybe they're like new to you, um, and kind of bridge that gap of connection by sharing vulnerably first. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you do it? It's really quite practical. Mm -hmm. um, and it, the, the data says that connection is um, being seen, heard, and valued. Mm. And so if you can do that with another person, you will create connection. That's great, that's great. Here's another question. If you have defense mechanisms that push people away when you're lonely, but you really do want to be close, what should you do? How do you trust people? Story of my life. <laughs> um, I feel like, so, my relationship with God has probably been some of the model for this because there have been times when God has felt so incredibly close. Mm. And then there have been times, days, weeks, months, maybe years that God felt just gone. Um, and so I did a lot of spiritual direction, um, which you can engage in through the Institute of Spiritual Formation, um, and had a lot of really good friendships that um, helped me reconnect with God. And when I reconnected with God kind of through this journey that I've been on at different points, he's felt near, he's felt far, um, the fact that God is consistent, that we can trust him, the fact that God, that God calls us to abide in him, John 15, is so beautiful that God is with us. Mm. Um, and so the pushing away, I've done that to God. Yeah. And yet God still calls me to come to him mm. um, and moves towards me. And so I think that my relationship with God has been a really good relationship to kind of embody the like, no God, I don't want anything to do with you, go away. And yet he's like my son, but come here. Yeah. And if, yeah, that's just, yeah. Yeah, so there, it seems like there's some sort of security there mm -hmm. where you can, um, you, can, you can risk a little bit with other people in some mm -hmm. sense, especially if they're also made in God's image. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, here's another question, okay? What, do you, what role do you think social media has played in this increase of all these negative products of loneliness? Um, so I've read a little bit on this and there's kind of two sides of belief on this because there's some data that shows that social media actually does help you connect to people. Yeah. Um, and then there's a lot of data that shows that it's actually a false sense of connection. Yeah. Um, and so it's probably played a role in confusing us of like what connection should or could look like because if it's purely digital, um, there's something that's lost. Um, and then also we've been there. You're like scrolling and you're like, oh, why didn't I get invited to go to that? Yeah. Th like, wait, that's literally like all my friends, but like I'm not there, like no one even like what happened to the group chat, did it die? Yeah. And so it's, it's, um, <laughs> it probably aggravates it a little bit um, yeah. because you see all of the things that you're not doing. Yeah. Um, and the reality is that, uh, yeah, I, we can't always be everywhere. And so yeah. social media makes us feel like we need to be everywhere all the time. And so we're doing all of these, like trying to mini connect with people, but really we're not really yeah. connecting them. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know what makes me feel really lonely is when I'm on Instagram and I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling and I, you know, I'm kind of trying to connect with people, I guess. And then at the end it says, you're up to date. It's like, I've seen everything. It's like, makes me feel, oh man, I've seen it. Okay, only me. All right, here's another question, okay? How can you invite Jesus into loneliness? Jesus is there. He's already in the loneliness. Um, I have found a great comfort in um, really believing that God is always with me. And so even when he doesn't feel like he's there, so I feel, I feel lonely because I'm like, I'm alone, God's not even here. Um, the truth is that he tells us that he's with us. Yeah. Um, 
So the how, I, th- I think it's an honest conversation with him where I, I've actually told God this, like, I don't feel like you're here. Mm. Um, and so I think it kind of circles back to some of what we said and even telling God, like, I'm having a hard time believing that you're here with me now. Yeah. Um, but God, would you come and would you be in this with me? Yeah. I think there's models in the Psalms too, mm-hmm. isn't there? Like, uh, people, Psalmists are saying, God, why are you so far away? God, how come they're winning and we're losing? Mm-hmm. And things like that. So I think there's, there's some fodder for prayer there mm-hmm. too. All right, great. Here's another question. What if it's really hard to make friends and failing to make friends makes me feel more lonely than before? So I would want to have a conversation with you, dear friend, about what friend means to you. Um, Because it might, if you're kind of imagining that it looks like connection to a lot of people, um, there might be some, you might be misunderstanding what friendship looks like. Um, and if you're having difficulty connecting to a person one-on-one, um, the journey kind of has to begin with yourself. And I wonder what it is that you, what walls have you put up that are actually making it really difficult for you to share yourself with another person? Um, that's kind of the short answer of that. I feel like I can go more, but I'm looking at the clock and freaking out. Okay, let's, let's get through some more questions. There's a lot of questions. It was just, okay, so here's another one. What's the boundary of sharing vulnerabilities? Very important. You cannot just tell everyone everything. That is a really, really, really oversharing, bad move. Yeah. Oversharing, we, wow. A Christian community is kind of, I feel like this is one of the things that we're known for is oversharing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's just, yeah. Um, <laughs> sometimes we think we can hotwire connection to another person mm. by oversharing. Mm. Um, so sometimes, and um, the hot, wire, hot wiring of connection Brene Brown talks about, um, it could be like we can have a common enemy. So maybe there's someone that we don't like, so we like talk about this person. And so suddenly that's the thing that um, connects us. But it could also just maybe me and kind of giving you everything and being like, okay, well, hurry, connect to this because I was just really vulnerable. Yeah. Um, so what, what are the boundaries? The boundaries are what is what feels safe for you to share with this person and why are you sharing it? Are you sharing it because you want to win their affection, their admiration? Do you want them to like you, follow you on Instagram, like whatever? What is your reasoning behind sharing this really vulnerable thing? Hmm. And if it's for any reason other than a genuine human connection out of a like deep care for the other person and wanting to wanting to build a healthy friendship relationship, yeah. then you're probably wanting to share for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Well, you know, I know that uh, when I when I overshare, sometimes I also feel like kind of like this vulnerability hangover. It's like the next vacuum. day. It's like, oh my gosh. It's called a vulnerability I, hangover. Is it okay? I it's, just made that. Yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. I'm a scientist now. Okay. <laughs> but like, is it, when do we, when do we know when we overshare it even the next day? And how do we how do we like approach that then? I would think that you can begin to ask yourself, why did I share that? What could I, how could I share that differently? And then it could even be a really good opportunity to circle back to the person that you shared with and say, do you know what? I'm realizing that I might have overshared a little bit with you. And so I'm sorry if that was a lot for you to take on and um, I'm not really looking for you to, to fix it. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that I, if I put anything on you. Um, and that, that feels like really good, healthy vulnerability. Yeah. That apology of being like, that was probably more than you needed to take on. Yeah, great, thank you. Here's another question. Can you give your definition of isolation versus solitude? How do we respond to these in Christ-like way? Um, so when I think of solitude, I think of Jesus going away to pray by himself, Jesus being um, in the desert. So these are times of solitude. This is an intentional, I am moving from this place to this place for this reason. That's solitude. Solitude is really, really good. It's really healthy. 
Um, isolation, the driver, the motivating drive to move from this place to this place, I think um, is shame. So if you're moving from this place to this place to be isolated, it's because you're saying something is wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Um, I am not good. I am not fill in the blank. And so it's the shame. So the shame is driving us from here to here. Isolation is more for the good of me as a human being, for my flourishing, to be more like Jesus, to um, be a healthy person. I'm going to take this day of solitude or this hour of solitude and to be quiet. And the second half of that question left, but I think it was in a how to do that in a Christ-like way. Yeah. Um, I would imagine that in solitude, there's kind of this constant conversation with God that's happening um, throughout that time. So it doesn't have to look like this deep time of intense prayer um, with God. Uh, it might look like a really casual conversation. And so solitude with God to me, um, my practice is that I often tell him literally whatever comes to mind. I've said, God, I'm really hungry. Um, <laughs> or do you know what would be good right now? A really good oat milk latte. That would be good. Um, and what I find is that that sort of simple conversation leads me to a place where my heart actually begins to come out and say, God, I'm really scared. Mm. Um, I feel like I'm failing at my job. Mm. I feel like Mike might be mad at me. I don't, I don't think I said that, but, um, and so suddenly those things come out a little bit more. Great. All right. So Chris, the way we end is we ask what biblical principles have shaped your thoughts for today? When I think of heaven, and I think of the great banquet that we will get to partake in. I'm so deeply moved by the lavishness of God, mm. that there is no expense that is spared, that there is nothing that is held back, mm. that it is, th this banquet is for you. Mm. And my mind can't, has a really hard time wrapping around that. Um, about the grandeur, about um, just all, all of the different components to it. But at the cornerstone of that is God's deep love and affection for us. And that I, you, we are the guests of honor at this banquet. Mm -hmm. um, and that he would do this for us out of his deep love for us. And so that relationship kind of sets the bar. Mm. Like, I kind of want to try to do that for all of my friends. I mean, I'm not going to like throw a banquet for you every, <laughs> you know, every day, but how can I throw a banquet for you maybe in my heart? Yeah. yeah. I don't know, that just came to mind. Um, but how can I set the table for goodness to happen between us? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today. Hey, let's give it up for Chris. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.